Welcome back, friends, to our series, Transforming Suffering with the Mindfulness and Compassion of Rain. And I'd like to start uh, sharing something uh, a friend told me. She was a hospice worker, and she had been at the bedside of tens of thousands of people when they were dying. And she told me that the greatest single regret of the dying was, I didn't live true to myself. I lived according to others' expectations. I lived uh, boxed by my own self-judgment. You know, I lived according to my fears and my reactivity, but I didn't live true to myself. And I was so struck by this because I realized that to live true to ourselves, really to live from our, our wise and awake hearts, we need meditation practices, ways of training our hearts and minds that help us step out of the grip of limiting beliefs and reactive emotions, that help us step out of that identification with a very separate, small, threatened self. And we need this when we're facing the deepest life challenges, divorce or the death of a dear one, a financial crisis, a health crisis. And we also need this kind of pathway to presence when we're reactive in daily life so we don't get caught up in our projections and our insecurities. I'd like to tell you a story about one woman who vacationed in a small town near the mountains. It was the same place that a very well-known American movie star, Paul Newman, vacationed. And every Sunday she would go on a long walk, and then she would go to her favorite shop and order a double dip chocolate ice cream cone. Well, one Sunday, she walked into the, into the shop, and the only customer there was this actor, Paul Newman, and he was there drinking coffee. So her heart skips a beat, and she gets really kind of tense and tight, but the actor just smiles, and she's, he's got these baby blue eyes, and he's sparkling. And she responds, trying to look calm. Now, inside, she's telling herself, oh my God, how do I look? What's he thinking? This is so embarrassing. Hold it together. Try to stay calm. <laughs> she goes and gets her cone, and she pays, and she leaves. And then when she gets to the car, she realizes she has the change, but she doesn't have her cone. So she has to go back into the coffee shop and see what happens. So she goes back in and it's the clerk does not have it. It's not on, a, on, the, on the counter. Finally, she looks over at Paul Newman and he's got this big grin on his face. And he says, you put it in your purse. <laughs> so as we know, when we get emotionally stirred up, we are no longer living from our most sane, our most awake, and our most mature uh, parts of our being. To understand homecoming, back to who we are, back to wholeness, it's important to understand what actually happens when we get reactive. What goes on in our body and mind when we get caught in anger, our fear, our hatred. I have a, a friend and a colleague, psychiatrist Dan Siegel, and he has a way of demonstrating what happens when we get reactive that I find so useful I want to share with you. And you might do this with me as I describe it, to take your hands and make a fist. Okay, and imagine that your hand is a brain, okay? And that the wrist and the spinal cord are going into the skull. This is the brain stem. And then the lower palm, and I'm going to open my hand to show you, that regulates fight, flight, freeze, okay? And your thumb, this is the limbic system. That's emotional arousal. And then these fingers are your frontal cortex and your whole cortex here. And that perceives the outside world. It's the home for reasoning and thinking. Now the prefrontal cortex, these very front of my fingers here, 
that correlates to attunement, to empathy, and to intuition. So mindfulness gets activated from this frontal cortex, and it has fibers that go down and inform the lower area. And the more mindfulness we have, the more when something's going up on our, our mindfulness, our executive functioning can inform and downregulate. It gives us perspective, it access to morality, insight, a remembrance of the larger social good. So as you see, information flows up, we might get activated and think, oh no, something's going wrong, I'm in danger. But then there's information flowing down from our frontal cortex that says, you've been in this situation before, it's going to work out, don't worry. Now, what happens when we have a lot of stress, okay, when something triggers us is we can flip our lid, okay? We can lose our connections. And when that happens, information's only flowing up where our whole reaction is being dominated by our survival brain, by our brain stem and our limbic system, and there's no regulation going on. So what we need to know, and this is from an evolutionary perspective, is that when we get reactive, what's happening is our limbic system here has taken over and we're no longer connected with our prefrontal cortex, which is the more recently evolved part of our brain. And this tendency to get hijacked by the less evolved parts of our brain leads us to fight, flight, freeze. It's the source of all the violence and suffering in the modern world. When we get reactive like that, it leads to war and racism, addiction, suicide, all our emotional suffering. There is a story from the mythology of the Buddha that guides us in how, if we're reactive, how to get reintegrated, how to bring mindfulness and compassion back online. The Buddha often would teach in fields outside of villages, and many people would gather. And on some occasions, the Buddha's loyal attendant Ananda would see Mara, the god of the shadow side, on the outskirts. Now Mara is the god of greed and hatred and aversion and delusion, all the, the unwanted and shadow qualities that live in every one of our psyches. And when Ananda would see Mara in the field, he'd get very upset. And he'd race over to the Buddha and say, oh no, Mara's here. But the Buddha had a very different response. He walked right over to Mara and he said to him, I see you, Mara. Come, let's have tea. I see you, Mara. Come, let's have tea. To me, this profound teaching from the Buddha really guides us in how we can relate to the challenging emotions that create so much reactivity in our bodies, in our hearts, and our minds. Now, just to take a moment, you might consider if a child, a young, young child, is very upset, what do they most need from their parents or their caretakers? Well, they need the parents or caretakers to see and understand that they're upset. They need to be seen. And they need to feel compassion. They need to feel that there's care coming in their direction. When we bring mindfulness and compassion inwardly, we're having tea with Mara. We're seeing what's going on inside us with clarity, and we're holding it with kindness. It's a kind of what I call spiritual reparenting. Seeing and having tea with our emotions allows them to heal. It allows us to reconnect with the gold. There's an evolutionary psychologist, Luis Cozzolino, who says we're not survival of the fittest, we're survival of the nurtured. And think of it individually, 
and as a species. Our survival and strength comes from being well cared for, being understood, appreciated, and loved. What I'd like to do is share a simple story with you now of how RAIN does this transformational self-nurturing, how step by step in RAIN we can have tea with Mara and heal. And in this particular story, a woman I worked with quite a while ago, um, the situation that triggered her, where she kind of flipped her lid, um, was at her weekly staff meeting with her corporation CEO. Now, he was a very brusque guy. He um, would cut off anyone he thought was wasting his time. And although she was really highly qualified for the job, and she knew her competence, he intimidated her. So when she was around him, she'd feel fearful, and she couldn't respond from her full intelligence. She was cut off from her full uh, frontal cortex activity, and she couldn't communicate her ideas or perspectives. We call it brain freeze. (laughs) So I helped her learn how to practice RAIN before one of those meetings. Now let's just go through the steps. She would feel that, that anxious feeling, anticipating the meeting, and she could recognize that. She could recognize, okay, this is anxiety, and name it like that. And then I invite her to just allow it to be there. This is basic mindfulness. Recognize it and allow it, not to fight it, not to deny it, not to judge it. Okay, anxiety's here. And then she deepened her attention as she investigated and began to sense what's really going on with the anxiety. And she could feel a dry mouth, and she could feel a tight chest and a pounding heart, and she could feel her stomach in knots. And I suggested she put her hand on her belly and breathe long and deep with the feelings so she could really pay attention to them. This is investigating, which is primarily somatic. We need to feel what's going on in our body. And then I asked the key question when you're investigating, which is, really, what did that part of her need? What did that fearful part of her need? How did it want her to be with it? She was surprised by the response. It wanted her to accept that it was there, that it belonged, that it was okay that anxiety was there. So, that led to nurturing, which was the message simply, it's okay that you're here, this belongs. So she nurtured, she sent that message inwardly, and then sat quietly for a few moments. And then she told me that she actually felt more space. The anxiety was still there, but there was more space, more ease. Now I want to pause and say to you that these moments after taking the steps of RAIN, after recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture, these moments of just resting and being in presence are really critical because they help our brains become more familiar with a, an enlarged sense of being. They, they strengthen the neuropathways to the gold. So after that, each week she would practice a light RAIN before meetings. And a light rain means just it wasn't a deep process, it was quick. And even during the meeting, she could do a very, very light rain inwardly, where she would recognize anxiety and just let it be there and feel it in her body, investigate it, and send the message, it's okay, this belongs. And that simple process calmed her nervous system. Again, survival of the nurtured. She had a pathway back to some space and balance. And then over time she was able to, as she got more and more used to being in those meetings, she was able to engage from her full intelligence and creativity. I share this story because everyone I know has situations that can trigger Mara the shadow or the difficult emotions, every one of us has them. And we all know that we then act in ways often that we regret. In some way we uh, say something that we wish we didn't say, or we act in some hurtful way 
to ourselves or others. If we can learn to bring rain to these situations, if we can learn to have tea with Mara, we can shift from that habitual reactivity really to responding from our inner strength. And the good news is this, whatever you practice gets stronger. In other words, if you keep replaying your reactive pattern of be anxious and go into brain freeze or blame yourself and feel small or get angry and uh, lash out at another person, Every time we play it out, we're strengthening the neural pathways to incline us to do it more. Instead, we can learn to pause and have tea with Mara and then respond from a much more creative and wise part of our being. Now, here's an important piece in the whole process. In whatever way we get emotionally stuck or reactive, we need to pause. Pausing interrupts what's going on. It gives us some choice in changing our patterning. The writer Viktor Frankl said that between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. And in that space is your power and your freedom. In that space is your power and your freedom. Having tea with Mara, the rain practice. It's a pause that's filled with presence. And through that pause and that presence, we regain access to really who we are. So let me go through the steps again so you get familiar with them and I'll make some comments. The first step is to recognize what's going on. Oh, anxiety, anger, sadness, and it helps to name it. You can even mentally whisper it or whisper it out loud. There's a lot of research now that shows that when you name an emotion, it decreases the activation of your limbic system and it increases the activation of your prefrontal cortex, which means you have more access to your executive functioning. So the first step is to recognize and name what's going on. The second step is allow. There's a saying that what we resist persists. It means that if we in some way are judging the present moment, it actually intensifies it. And that when we allow, it creates some space for whatever's going on to come and go. It reduces stress. And again, it allows us, our prefrontal cortex to come online. I think of it like um, an ocean with waves. We have waves of, let's say, anxiety or anger or fear. And if you know that you're the ocean, if you're that ocean of mindfulness, you're not going to be afraid of the waves. There's room. There's space. Of course, if we forget the ocean, then we can get seasick all the time in the waves. So allow opens us to a larger perspective, makes room for the waves to come and go. Investigate. In the moments of investigating, we're no longer so caught in the waves. We're more resting in that witness that sees what's going on, but isn't identified with it. What that means is that in terms of our neuropsychology is that there's more of an integrated presence with the prefrontal cortex. We're not stuck solely in our limbic system. And I want to again remind you that investigating is primarily somatic. Another saying, your issues are in your tissues. And what that means is you can't think your way into healing. Primarily we need to have the courage to investigate and discover where experience lives in our body, to breathe with it and be with it and offer nurturing to that experience in a very direct way. And research shows that in the moments of nurturing, in the moments of self-compassion, again the prefrontal cortex is activated. Now, what I call after the rain that's the moments of resting and presence after we've done the four steps. As I mentioned earlier, 
That's a crucial part of the practice, getting familiar with the presence that has emerged. Um, It trains us so that the state of open-hearted presence becomes a trait, an enduring trait. And how does that happen? Well, again, whatever we pay attention to, where energy goes, uh, attention wakes up. We, we, we become more aware of it. And it strengthens the neural pathways to that state. So let's say you feel a sense of compassionate presence, and then you really sense, oh, what's this like? And really open to it. The more it becomes familiar, the more it actually calls you to it. They say that neurons that fire together wire together. We have more ease and homecoming. And the beauty is we start trusting this awake, open-hearted presence as more the truth of who we are than any story we tell about ourselves. This is where the practice of RAIN actually allows us to open to our Buddha nature, our true nature. We sense that presence, and then we sense that that presence is really who we are, more than any of those limiting stories. I have seen over and over how this inner work of RAIN inevitably uh, reconnects us with our full potential of awareness and love. And I've seen how that ripples out so that as we practice, it touches the lives of others that we're with. You'll see that, I think, in this following illustration. I was working with an executive at an internet technology firm, and he was very much known for having a bad temper. And when his anger started causing serious problems in his marriage, that's when he began practicing mindfulness. And I guided him in how to apply rain to his anger, because he said it was totally out of control. He'd be angry at his wife, at his teens, at employees. And so I taught him how when he became alert to the cues of anger, his angry thoughts and feelings, he'd pause for rain. He'd do the R, recognize, by just naming, okay, anger, anger. Then he'd allow letting the experience in his body and mind be there. And then he'd investigate and feel the feelings in his body, not doing anything, just feeling it there and whisper to himself, it's okay. Then he'd pause again for a moment, that's after the rain, to notice if there's any shift. Well, he reported to me after practicing a while that when he got triggered with anger, 25% of the time, he did not say anything he regretted. Now, that's that's a big improvement, that 25% of the time, he actually was able to ride the waves and not get caught in them. And he told me about one of these times, and that's what I want to share with you. He was meeting with a project manager, and the project manager admitted that his team had fallen behind on a major project, and that he personally had let a few things fall between the cracks. So he was taking responsibility. Well, as this man I've been telling you about listened, he felt this rising irritation. And typically, he would have attacked, he would have pounced on him. But instead, he said, okay, Rain. (laughs) And he recognized, and he allowed it to be there, and he breathed with it, and he felt it in his body, and he said, it's okay to himself. And he felt a little more presence, and he didn't blow up. Instead, he took the guy in a little more. He paid closer attention and appreciated his honesty and sensed his commitment to his work. So not only did he not have an angry attack, he actually expressed appreciation. He said, well, I'm sure you're doing the best you can. The manager was caught off guard. And he told him, I didn't plan to say this. And he had tears in his eyes. He said, my wife has stage four breast cancer, and I have two teens, and it's really been a rough time, a difficult time. So when this guy had said, I know you're doing the best you can, it made them both very vulnerable. And 
the man I was working with said, you know, we hugged then. We hugged, both of us with tears. And a few months ago, I would have unwittingly added to this man's burden. And there we were hugging. It was one of my saddest and best moments. It was like I found my way back to being a real human being. Most of us, if we're honest, can see how when we get caught in our reactivity, we leave our best self. We're, we live from a much smaller place. And how much more aliveness and intimacy and creativity in our life if we could just pause in those moments when we're being hijacked by our limbic system. Just pause and learn to have tea with Mara to recognize, allow, investigate, nurture, and just let a little bit of a larger and more loving presence emerge. How much possibility that would open up. So you can see for this man, interrupting his patterning, his anger with rain, led to new levels of connecting with people both at work and at home. It opened him to a new way of being. Now, rain helps us shift from a reality that's really imprisoned by limiting thoughts and emotions to a wise heart. And one of my favorite teachers, Sri Nursargadatta, has a beautiful saying. He says, the mind creates the abyss and the heart crosses it. The mind creates the abyss and the heart crosses it. Our mind, with all the stories about who's wrong, what's going to go wrong, all the fear-based thinking creates separation. And our heart, when we learn to deepen attention and have tea with Mara, our heart learns to reconnect. Our heart learns to bring us back home to loving presence. Before we practice together, I'd like to just offer a few guidelines to support you as you explore this on your own. And one thing is that the length of rain can vary. Um, I shared one story where the woman, sometimes even in the middle of a meeting, could do a little miniature or light rain. Um, and so, and that would just take, you know, 30 seconds. Um, could be a few minutes where we just pause and go through the process. Our rain can be like a therapy session, could take 30, 45 minutes if we really immerse into it. So what this means is you can practice whenever you get triggered by Mara. You know, a short version at work, or you can practice a longer version when you have more time. You can do rain alone. It's also very powerful to do RAIN with the guidance of a therapist or a teacher or a healer. And for more and more people now, people are doing RAIN with a partner, with a peer. And that is, I found, is incredibly helpful to people. Um, when I lead workshops now, increasingly I'll, ha I'll guide people in small groups doing RAIN and sharing the process with each other. And if these kind of alternatives interest you, all the information on RAIN is on my website under RAIN Resources homepage. You can take a deeper dive. And if you want to go even deeper, my book Radical Compassion is a full guide to how to use RAIN in all different situations, and that might be helpful too. Finally, many people are experiencing trauma these days. People have been traumatized all through history, but we're becoming more aware of it. And if you're approaching RAIN, or let's say you're a healthcare provider and your client's approaching RAIN and they feel unsafe and, and they feel like it might tap into more trauma, it's important, instead of going right into RAIN, to first just nurture. We call it resourcing sometimes. 
Just take the time to establish a sense of safety, a sense of love and connection, some sort of a anchor for well-being um, before going into the practice. So they have some resilience and, and then, uh, then go into the RAIN sequence knowing that if things get difficult, you can go back and sense your, your resource anchor. And an example would be, let's say you have a parent that is, is very comforting or let's say you have a, a deity that you relate to are, let's say, there's a set of words that are comforting, that you practice using those to bring out a sense of comfort and stability and safety and care. And then when you go in doing RAIN, you know you've got that if you need to step out of the practice to come back to a more resourced inner state, you've got that pathway. All that is going to say that if there's a lot of trauma, it's best to do it with a therapist who can support you and hold the container for that. I started uh, this session sharing about my friend who's a hospice worker and the regrets of the dying. I didn't live true to myself. We long to have our lives aligned with what most matters to us. We all do. And so what we'll do now is explore how the RAIN practice can reconnect us to our own deepest wisdom and to a caring heart. Please find yourself a posture, a way of sitting that is comfortable, a way of sitting where you feel alert and yet at ease. And once you settle down some, you might close your eyes. And let's breathe together, taking a nice, long, deep in-breath. And with the out-breath, letting go, letting go. And one more nice, long, deep in-breath, filling the chest and the lungs. Letting go with the out-breath, relaxing, releasing. And letting your breath resume in its natural rhythm. You might gently scan through your body and see if there's anything that wants to let go in your body. Maybe there's extra tension in your shoulders that you can soften. Perhaps you can let the hands be softer and rest easily, effortlessly in your lap, touching each other or not. Let the chest be open, the belly soft. Letting the breath go deep into the belly. Feeling your body sitting here and breathing. So you begin with presence. Now I invite you to bring to mind something about your current life that triggers difficult emotions such as anxiety, anger, or self-judgment. It might be related to work, or perhaps it's something going on in a relationship, some conflict, maybe something to do with parenting, your concerns for other people. It may have to do with stress around your health or another's health, finances, or maybe it's an addictive behavior you're worried about. Bring to mind something that that triggers difficult emotions but not trauma because that won't serve you as we practice together. And 
scan for an actual situation that exemplifies this, where this happens. Once you have a situation in mind, take some moments to actually enter the experience. So you're visualizing the scene that you're in. If it involves another person, perhaps hearing the words and seeing their face. And let your attention go to right where you feel is most charged, where you feel most activated, upset. Sensing the worst part of this. And here's where you pause and recognize the R of rain, recognize what's happening. So just sense what's most predominant. What's the mood or emotion that most stands out to you? And it's fine if there's more than one, but just mentally name what you're aware of. You might use an inner whisper, fearful, or confused, or angry. Naming and recognizing what you're aware of. The A of rain is to allow this to be just as it is. Allowing is a pause within the pause where you intentionally agree to let whatever you're experiencing be here. You might say, this belongs. Like a wave in the ocean, this experience belongs in your overall experience. This is part of it. This allows you to then begin to deepen attention and investigate and sense what inside you most wants attention right now. Perhaps what's most difficult to feel or what have you been unwilling to feel. And perhaps you'll sense a place of failure or shame, judgment, hatred, fear. As you sense this whole situation and these feelings, you might notice, well, what am I believing right now? Am I believing something bad's going to happen? That something's wrong with me? That I'm failing in some way? That something's wrong with someone else or with life? And with whatever you might be believing, feel how the belief lives in your body. When you're believing, say, that something's wrong with you, what's that like in your body? Check your throat, your heart, your belly. What is it like? How does it feel? What's the felt sense of it like? Is it clenched or tight? hot, sore, aching, squeezed. If you want to deepen your attention to this, you might let your face express the feeling and even let your body posture express the feeling. And what do you notice? Notice the most vulnerable part inside you. 
the part that's most triggered, most hurting. See if you can bring your attention right there and it might help you at this point to put your hand on your heart, your belly, wherever you feel vulnerability because that will deepen your steadiness of attention and it also begins the nurturing. Do it gently. And now deepen the investigation and ask the part of you that's most triggered, how do you want me to be with you? What do you most need? What is this place in you need to trust or feel or remember? If you listen deeply, maybe you'll sense that it's calling for you to love it. It's saying, please love me, hold me, forgive me, accept me. What does it need? What does it want to feel? For the N or nurturing, You might gently adjust your posture, take a few deep breaths, and feel your intention to offer care to the part of you that most needs it. You might call on your high self, your wisest self, your awake heart. Or you might sense that you're calling on the wisdom or love in the universe to help with that nurturing. And take these next moments to offer care inwardly. If you haven't already, I encourage you to put your hand on your heart and vary the touch until it's tender. And then sense what words will most comfort the part of you that needs healing. It might be as simple as, I love you, or trust your goodness, or I'm here, I'm not going away, or thank you for trying to protect me, but I'm okay right now. If it's hard to offer yourself comfort, you might imagine the love and comfort coming from some other being, someone that you trust and care about, a parent, a child, a friend, a pet. Might be from a spiritual figure that you trust and love. Imagine the words and the energy of care flowing in through your hand into your heart. Explore what it means to really let in nurturing, let in love. You might visualize and imagine and sense light and warmth bathing the part of you that needs healing. You might imagine the part of you that's scared or vulnerable just surrendering and dissolving and relaxing into loving presence, filled and held by loving presence. And 
And once we've done the step of nurturing, we rest in after the rain, just sensing whatever the presence is that's emerged, the quality of heart. And just relax and let it fill you. Rest in it. Be familiar with it. Just noticing the difference between when you started the meditation and this heart space and presence that's here now. In these moments, what is the sense of your being, the deepest sense of who you are? Who are you when you're not believing something's wrong with you or wrong with the world? Resting in heart space and knowing it as your true home. As you feel ready to end the meditation, please take a few breaths and open your eyes. And if you find it helpful, you might write in your journal whatever you learned through this practice, the challenges and the insights. I thank you for your presence, my friends, and I look forward very much to being with you for our next session. Blessings.